Thanks so much, Mr. Schultz. This is very inspiring. Thanks so much. We can move, we can move to the final part and the exciting part of our discussion with the students. So we have uh, selected five pools of questions uh, related to different uh, elements of uh, Starbucks business model and your view of the, of the business and the world. And so we get started with the uh, first portion of questions on innovation and digital strategy. And so I leave the floor to Polina Rodigina. Hello. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Schulz, for being here. Uh, my name is Polina Rodigina. I study management. And uh, here's my question. Uh, what role does big data analysis play in the Starbucks strategy? And more specifically, uh, which data do you collect? Uh, which insights do you derive from it? And how do you see the future of big data in your company? Well, uh, can you uh, ask the first part a little slower? Sorry. OK. Uh, what role does big data analysis play in Starbucks digital strategy? Data analysis? Big data. A, a biz data, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I am not a big research guy. <laughs> uh, however, uh, over the last few years, um, I have gotten religion. And um, we now have a pretty large group of people uh, who are doing a lot of data analysis, data mining, uh, and using that to create ways in which we can provide personalization uh, and understand the information of our customers much better. And the reason for that is um, we have a very significant mobile ecosystem in which about 25% of all our customers pay by phone in North America and in China. And that data has provided us with a lot of information to better serve our customers and understand a lot of opportunities that we did not have before. Having said all that, I think we need to balance the entrepreneurial DNA of intuition uh, and understanding of the marketplace and the customer with uh, theory, consultancy, data mining, and research, and not tip the scale too far one way or another. Does that make sense? Thank you very much. So we move to Alexander Nenanovic. Hello, Mr. Schultz. Thank you again for being here. I'm Alexander Nenadovic from Serbia, studying marketing management here in Bocconi. And uh, my question is, uh, in this age when everybody is trying often successfully to create disruptive innovation uh, that would change the industry and allow them to win against the powerful incumbents in the market, is Starbucks worried that this might happen to them too? And uh, what is Starbucks doing to remain the leader in innovations and prevent this from happening? Mm -hmm. I, I would say this, that um Whatever industry uh, your company is in today, uh, it's never been more important to understand that your success, if linked to the status quo, will be a death trap. So uh, success can be a uh, humbling factor if, in fact, you are not pushing for reinvention and self-renewal. And what I like to say to our people is, we as a company need to see around corners before anyone else, which means we need to have the curiosity and the courage to see things before other people see them and then have the moral courage to make a bet on what that's gonna be. And I think sometimes success uh, can produce hubris and a mentality of laziness because you're not as hungry as you once were when you're fighting. And the road is paved with many, many companies who have achieved great success, who no longer are on the landscape. Uh, you're too young to remember when Sony ruled the world with a Walkman. Uh, but I do remember that. And uh, you know, Sony is a great company, but they should have been Apple. Uh, Blackberry is another example, and we could go on and on. 
but reinvention, self-renewal, and maintaining that, that incredible hunger to realize that your success is not an entitlement must be the mentality of the leaders of the company. Thank you very much. Follow, following on, on these questions, can you elaborate a little bit more on what Starbucks is doing in these days uh, in order to spur this entrepreneurship spirit within the employees? Well, I'd say, first off, on digital technology, uh, we, we recognized early on that if you are going to be a successful bricks and mortar retailer today, you must be as relevant on people's smartphones as you are inside a bricks and mortar environment. Uh, secondarily, um, the, the customer experience, we must create Starbucks as a destination which means that the theater, the romance, and the store we're going to build in Milan in the old post office will demonstrate such drama, theater, romance, and I think we have an opportunity to reinvent retail with that store opening. But it's the kind of thinking that says all of our success to date, whatever it might be, is not good enough for tomorrow. You have specific units within the organization that um, work on business development or these uh, scenarios related to what the company should do in the future. I, I don't think we have a specific, I mean, we have a digital group and we have, but if you're not an entrepreneur at Starbucks and challenged the status quo, it's on all of us, not one person or one group. Thank you very much. So we move to the second set of questions on customer and brand experience. And uh, the floor is to Alicia Wixen. Um, my name is Alicia Wong. I'm American and I'm a student with the World Bachelor in Business. So exactly what we were talking about before, um, I wanted to ask how Starbucks offline customer experience will kind of integrate with new technologies. For example, RFID tracking, um, collection and use of customer data, and also the Internet of Things. Um, sometimes you can create a ancillary benefit for the customer that not only is a benefit to the customer, but if you're lucky enough, it can produce a new source of revenue and profit. So if we look at the mobile ecosystem that we built at Starbucks over the last few years, uh, I don't think any of us ever believed that uh, $2 billion would be preloaded uh, during the holiday quarter, last quarter, on people's phones, either for themselves or as a gift. Um, in addition to that, uh, in China, over the last three weeks, in a partnership with Tencent, we launched social gifting. Uh, and the velocity of social gifting in China in three weeks uh, has shocked us in terms of Chinese consumers being able to send a latte or actually currency to another person, all because of the equity and the affinity of the Starbucks brand. So uh, no company, I believe, can succeed today without a fully integrated digital strategy. And that digital strategy is complicated because the level of technology and consumer adoption is moving faster than any company's ability to parallel it unless you are a true tech company. But the learning is that every company, regardless of the business you're in, must be a tech company. So how does that affect the offline experience? Well, I think what, how it affects it is that um, offline, the relevancy of the equity of the Starbucks brand and the emotional connection with, we have with our customers has to be equal to or even greater than what happens inside a store. So as an example, uh, we just created for the first time a proprietary digital content series of 10 episodes on people's phones. And uh, in two months time, 70 million Americans viewed that content. And that content, by the way, was unbranded, but it was all based on ordinary Americans doing extraordinary things demonstrating our belief in what humanity should be, which added value to the brand and the perception of the company. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So always on customer and brand experience, Gianmarco Brizzolara. My name is Gianmarco Brizzolara. I'm a master in international management student. 
And um, when we regard um, other firms which, develop, uh, which um, deliver premium uh, products and services, we were able to see in the past that um, a stronger spread of the companies can lead to a dilution of the brand and hence profit margins. And Starbucks grew significantly in the past years, especially since the financial crisis. Um, so how are you guarding against brand dilution and connected to it, um, how do you see the potential for further growth of Starbucks in different geographic regions such as Asia, Europe and America? That's a lot of question. <laughs> uh, okay, let me, let me try and take that one piece at a time. First off, when you are referring to brand dilution or margin compression as a result of digitizing your business, what I think you're referring to is traditional bricks and mortar retailers in order to compete with Amazon and others, have, they needed to create a opportunity for online commerce, e-commerce business. But in doing that, they diluted their core business and diluted their margin. So as an example, Walmart, Macy's, all of these big box retailers no longer have the physical traffic to support their infrastructure, so they're creating an offline business. But those, that offline business, in order to invest in creating it, the infrastructure, and the margins, they are suffering even though they're creating more growth. That's, your, that's answer one, I believe. There was also, um, yeah, I more wanted to ask about like the store locations you have. Like you opened, I think it went from around 19,000 in 2008 yeah. to 25,000 today. Yeah. So um, if there is a Starbucks at every corner, basically, this can maybe lead to a dilution of the brand. Yeah, or, well, yeah, that's um, maybe, mm. but not the case. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and and l let me try and explain why. Um, more often than not, ubiquity is not a friend to a consumer brand because it's very hard. Most things that have gotten big have not stayed small. So our challenge is how do you get big and stay small? How do you stay special? How do you maintain your premium position and pricing? And the answer is we created segmentation. So we're, we've opened lots of stores all over the world, but none of them look the same. And different locations require a different format, a drive through format, a roastery, which will open in Milan, a small store that's based on speed and transactions in the morning. Um, but all of it threaded into a premium experience. But we have found over the years that the opportunity for growth for Starbucks is greater than we originally thought and we have not cannibalized existing stores. And I think sometimes, not all the times, if you're gonna be big, not literally, but if you're gonna be big, sometimes it's better to be bigger if in fact you can maintain the culture and values of the company. So let's go back to my, my comments. Everything we do, every question that's being asked, everything we've done around the world is on the foundation of the culture and values of the company. That is the equity of the brand. That's the secret sauce. Everything we stand for. And the reason we've been able to do these things, as well as universal acceptance all over the world, is because the culture of the company comes through to the customer. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks so much. So we move to the third set of questions on uh, uh, internationalization and service replicability. And so we have Dui Gu Kaya. I, you know, I'm not smart enough to answer all these questions. <laughs> But go ahead. Uh, hi, I'm Hande Kaya. I'm from Turkey, and I study Masters of Management. Uh, consistency in product is one of the trademarks of Starbucks. And you have previously stated that cutting prices is not a sustainable business strategy. So I wanted to ask more about the expansion in Italy. How will the prices adjust to market, or are there going to be different solutions to enhance customer experience? Does attracting customers with the premium price for coffee. Yeah. Um, these are smart kids. <laughs> you see? How old, can I ask how old you are? Me? Yeah. I'm, I'm 23. Wow. Very smart. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, I have to remember the question now, which I, I've got, I got, I got. The, first off, uh, opening in Italy 
uh, has been with Starbucks for many years. And um, we've opened 75 countries over the last 20 years or so. And there's no country more important to the company and to me personally than opening Italy in a way that creates the kind of respect and humility among the Italian customers. And they, they see for themselves that we're the kind of company they want to support. But we recognize that our success all over the world does not entitle us to success here. We have to earn it. So uh, first off, um, uh, there's a great baker in Milan named Rocco Princi, who's sitting here today. Uh, I travel all over the world, and I've never tasted anything like what his bread tastes like and all of the culinary things he does. So the first thing I did unsuccessfully for many years is try and convince him to be our partner, but he always said no. And then finally, finally, I got on my knees and, and, and he said yes. So we will have Princhi food, not only in Italy, but also in America and in China. And I think the quality of that food automatically will represent uh, what Starbucks is trying to achieve. We're building not a store, but a shrine to coffee. And the experience, the theater, the roasting, the education, uh, and we're going to wait. We're not opening any store until the post office opens. The pricing, I think, we haven't decided, but uh, it won't be a barrier. We won't allow pricing to be a barrier. We want it to be fair and equitable. Uh, but we're going to be bringing an experience that I think most Italians have not seen before. And I, I couldn't be more excited because the design is extraordinary. And I think young people are going to want to be there and uh, should be, I, I can't wait. Uh, and I think we've, we've worked very hard to kind of get it right, and we had a lot of help from a lot of friends of ours in Italy who have helped us, and I think it's going to be good. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. If I may ask, yeah. <clears throat> will this be a new concept or just a store for Milan? Uh, it is a pretty new concept. We have one in Seattle. We're opening one in China in December, but uh, the Milan store and our architect designer sitting right there. She's a genius. Uh, this, is, this store is, is we're, we're breaking the bank. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs>
do everything you can to keep making a deposit in that reservoir every day. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we move to the fourth set of questions of corporate social responsibility, which you already touched upon in your speech. Julian Stauffer. Hi, I'm Julian Stauffer. I'm from New York, and I'm here at Stavokoni doing my MBA. Where in New York are you from? Uh, I grew up in Westchester. What town? Bedford. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know who you are. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you for your speech. It, it means a lot, and I think everyone here really appreciated it. Thank you. Um, regarding Starbucks' decision to hire 10,000 refugees over the next five years, can you please speak about what goes into that kind of decision? Mm -hmm. And what are the various considerations? How are the final decisions determined? And what are the internal or external barriers that you face? I think uh, that's a very important question because it's not only about hiring 10,000 refugees. Um, I think it speaks to what a organization's core purpose and reason for being is. Um, and standing up for what you believe is right. Um, I've taken a lot of criticism from a number of people since we made that decision. And uh, what I try to say to them is not every decision is an economic decision. And um, I believe that um, as a public company, we are bound by financial performance. And that is the price of admission. I get that completely. And we have been a great financially performer over the many years we've been public. I think right now, uh, every single day, there are things that affect our lives that are being challenged. And whether you are American and in America Republican or Democrat or European, um, these decisions have a significant cause and effect on the world and humanity. And I think we are all, in a sense, being tested about how we're going to respond and react and um, I recently gave a speech and I said, in a way, it's a personal crucible, a test to see what is your core purpose and reason for being. And I think when you think about leadership, uh, it's very easy, very easy to lead when it's convenient. It's very difficult to lead when the wind and the headwinds are in your face. And true leadership, authentic leadership, which the world is void of, and we're, we're longing for it, is right now defined by how we are going to respond when we are challenged. And I believe our company uh, stands for something more than making money. I think our company stands for trying to get things right and stand up for truth, humanity, and I should say, and I think it's important to say publicly, we're not a perfect company, and we make mistakes, and we have disgruntled employees, and we don't get everything right, but your heart, your soul, and your conscience, your conscience uh, is vitally important to consider when these things are coming up. And that is why we made that decision. As a, as a US citizen, uh, I just want to thank you for making that decision. I think that was a good one. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You. Can, can I follow up this question, which I think is extremely important, because oftentimes corporate America is criticized because of the kind of governance and the short-termism of decisions. So can I ask, how could you convince your board? And in general, how can you convince the people 
the directors of Starbucks in order to take these decisions that go beyond you know the short term profit, but you know move mm -hmm. more towards uh, important elements like, yeah. for example, those that you mentioned. The, the board of Starbucks is very engaged in the company, and it is a heavy board in terms of who the people are, famous people like Secretary Gates, Senator Bradley, and other luminaries. Recently, the CEO of Lego, the CEO of Microsoft, uh, both of whom are coming on the Starbucks board. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that we spend a lot of time in the board meeting not only talking about the marketplace, the economics, profitability, growth, strategy, we're talking about social impact and our responsibility. Now, there's great debate on the board, Republicans and Democrats, about what we should do and how we should do it. Uh, but there's been great support to stand up for what is just. Um, not that everyone agrees with me, and I'll give you one example. I think this is important, and this, was, this created a lot of public um, discourse. Uh, our annual meeting as a public company attracts thousands of people, thousands, and it's March 22nd this year. And we, we could, our audience is, it's a huge thing. And, uh, and we put on a show. Uh, we do a lot of interesting things, and, but the Q&A usually lasts a great, very long time. So two years ago, um, we decided as a company uh, that we were going to stand up for health insurance for the spouses or partners of our gay employees. And we had a shareholder in the Q&A stand up and say that we had returned 38% year over year shareholder value, but he had concluded in his own research that it would have been higher if we did not provide insurance to the partners of our gay employees. 38%. And I stood up and I said, sir, if you believe you can get a greater than 38% return on your investment in one year, and you're not satisfied with us being the kind of company that embraces inclusion and diversity, respectfully, you should sell your stock. And you would have thought, uh, well, first off, it was, it was received very well in the auditorium but not so well from the press. And again, moral courage, leadership, and doing what we believe is right. Thank you very much. Last one on corporate social responsibility, Paula Monteiro de Freitas. Yes, my name is Paula Freitas. I'm from Brazil, and I'm currently a full-time MBA student here in Bocconi. And my question is, um, being a quick service restaurant, one of the biggest challenges is producing the quantity of packaging and waste production. How is the company tackling issues such as recyclable packaging on a national and international level? And how is that impacting the company's long-term strategy? So your question, I think, is a question that we are asking ourselves a great deal inside Starbucks today about our carbon footprint, our responsibility in lots of areas of the company. Uh, the, the area that I'm probably most proud of uh, is the area of replanting coffee trees all over the world because of the issue of sustainable coffee practicing. So we've planted over 20 million trees and we have opened agronomy offices in many places around the world where we buy coffee to teach sustainable practices. Having said that, we do go through way at well over a hundred million paper cups a week. And uh, there is lots of challenges around recycling domestically and around the world. This is a very complex question and problem that we have not solved to the expectation of the market and, or our own. 
and we have a lot of work to do in that area. But something we are very focused on and understand that we have to be a leader in that area as well as the other things that we're trying to lead in. It's the right question, and we're, we're just doing as best we can at this point. Thank you. So last but not least, on human capital and organization. So last question is about this topic, and uh, uh, the student is Phil Boydens. So hi, my name is Phil. I'm doing the SEMS Master in Management program here, and I'm from Belgium. So my question is about uh, an organization's success depends on the people it employs and their ability to have a vision for a brand and consequently also execute that vision. And so I was wondering how does Starbucks ensure that it recruits the right people? And given the size of the organization, uh, how do you enable them to enact also change within the organization? One of the great challenges of Starbucks today is how do we communicate effectively to over 300,000 people in 75 countries, different language, time zone, politics, culture, all of those issues, um, in addition to how do we attract and retain great people. Uh, the first thing I'd say is um, we have to be a customer-facing organization to drive revenue and profit. But anyone who works at Starbucks realizes that we are a partner-focused company. We're a people-focused company. Many years ago, I said, we're in the people business serving coffee, not the coffee business serving people. We mean that. Now, um, we're a decentralized organization, so our business in China is run by a Chinese president. Our business in Europe is run by a European president, uh, and so on and so forth. But we are threaded into uh, something what I would call a memory, and that is, like a young child, our business has been imprinted with the way we do things, our values, our guiding principles, and the way we communicate. And so once a quarter, uh, we're having town hall meetings in as many markets as we can around the world, not so much to talk to our people, but to hear from them. And um, two weeks ago, we did something uh, which was extraordinary, uh, and that is uh, we piloted something with Facebook called Facebook Workplace, and um, we're able to have an interactive meeting with 10,000 store managers in an interactive setting, live and online. We've now done this twice, where we're, we're getting best practices and we're talking to our people, and in real time we're getting feedback on all kinds of subjects, and using that now to create smaller groups within uh, the Facebook workplace so that they can have their own interaction with one another. That's just one example. We live in a community where Amazon is located, they're growing at leaps and bounds. They are recruiting like crazy. They have 8,500 open positions in Seattle, Washington alone. So if you're graduating, Amazon's looking for you. Uh, but so it's, we, we have to attract and retain great people, not only because we are paying better or have better uh, benefits, but because of the culture and values of the company. And that's why we have to keep investing in it and make it real. Uh, and we can only succeed and, and continue to grow effectively if we're attracting and, and, and maintaining the, the smartest people. And then we have to create an environment where they feel they have a voice. So. Wonderful. I think that uh, we're almost concluded. We have to take a family photo here. But before conclusion, I would like to ask you a question. You leave. You gave a beautiful message to the audience before, to our students, so what they should do in the future, yeah. and so following there. So my question is to you is, uh, what would you suggest to, to our faculty? So essentially, were you a dean of business school yeah. in 2017? What would be a message that you would give to, to the faculty that every day has to train students mm -hmm. to, in order to let them you know, go to the world of practice and, and give you know, importance, guidance to people there? I think my answer to that question would be, I, I'm not sure I would, I would allow any single seismic social change 
in the world within that 24-hour period to be unspoken. So if you're teaching chemistry or science, but something happens around abortion or immigration or uh, the election in France or, or whatever it might be, or in Germany, uh, or what's happening with ISIS, any of the issues that are affecting all of our lives every day, I don't think if I was a teacher, I'd walk into that classroom and not spend five, 10 minutes saying, something really important happened today and we should discuss it. Whether or not it was compatible with the discipline you're teaching or not, because the cause and the effect of what's happening in the world today is real, it's serious, and it is going to affect all of our lives. And we need, we need to be curious, we need to be informed, and we need to be engaged. I think this is extremely useful, and I hope that our faculty members will follow this suggestion because yeah. I think it's a, great, it's a great idea. So thank you very much one more thank time you. for this inspiring talk. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.